Well, good morning. Good morning. Here we are, Thursday already, and uh, it's been going quickly. I trust that the Lord will renew us and refresh us today to be able to take in the Word of God and be blessed by it. I'd like you to turn again to the book of Galatians, please, chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from verse 19 down to the end of the chapter. And Galatians 5, 19, down to the end of the chapter, it says this, verse 1, or verse 19, that now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And again, God will bless that reading to us uh, this morning. So we're on this section where we're talking about freedom from the flesh. And one of the things that he wants us to see is, what, what does it look like? What, what are we talking about when we talk about the flesh? What does, what does the flesh produce? And it's kind of interesting. We've already had mentioned in verse 16, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And now we have now the works of the flesh. So the lust of the flesh is that those inner cravings, uh, those strong desires to, to satisfy the flesh, and the works is when we give in to those cravings, this is what's produced. This is the result of giving in to those inner cravings. And it's not pretty. And we've kind of uh, mentioned, I think, yesterday briefly, but uh, it's kind of an interesting contrast. Uh, I, I like to think of it in terms of a factory, uh, you know, kind of a works where, where the, the factory produces... Uh, uh, of course, all of this stuff, and it's very polluting. And the other picture is an orchard where fruit is produced. And if you can keep those two pictures clearly in your mind, this, this polluting factory, very industrious, constantly manufacturing stuff, but it's not very nice. It's, it's filthy. It's polluting the whole atmosphere. And then on the other hand, this orchard and producing beautiful fruit. Right, so those are the, that's the contrast that I want us to get before us. And so as we as we think about these things, uh, he wants us to know. He says in verse sixteen, uh, sorry, verse um, verse nineteen, the works of the flesh are manifest. And so that if we give in to these inner cravings, it will it will it will be put on show. It will it will be seen. It'll be it'll be open and obvious. Uh, to, for all to see, open and visible. And, and so, and, and again, we've got to recognize this, that even if it's not immediately, eventually, if we are constantly, as it were, feeding the flesh, it will come out. And it will be seen. And it will be evident. And people will see it. Okay, so we, we got to recognize this, that, uh, you know, don't be mocked. What you sow, you'll also reap. If, if you're constantly giving in to the indulgences of the flesh, even if you're doing it thinking you're doing it in secret, it ultimately will come out. It can't be hidden. That flesh will come out. It will be revealed. And he wants us to know that. <laughs> and so uh, we've got to ask ourselves, is this, is this what I want? Uh, do I want to produce this in uh, pollutant in my life? Is that what I want to be seen? Or do, would I, in, in contrast, desire that lovely fruit that is described the rest of the section? So we're going to go through and we're going to kind of just talk about all of these things. And 
we want to think of it in terms of how devastating all of these things are, not only to our own personal testimony, not only to uh, the fact that as representatives, ambassadors for Christ, we're giving a, a, a poor picture of, of our Lord, right? If, and, you know, you'd hate for somebody to say, well, if that man's a Christian, I don't want to be one, right? So we've got to recognize that we're ambassadors for the Lord Jesus. What, what people see of us might be all they ever see of the Lord Jesus. And so I hope what they see is something beautiful. Instead, if they see this stuff, it, it could cause them to say, no, that's not for me. They're no better than we are. In fact, they're worse than we are. <laughs> and wouldn't that be a terrible thing? And sadly, that's part of what's happening in our culture. Right? That sadly, many Christians are living no better than the world and often worse. And so it's a real turnoff. So, that, so, there's, so there's this individual aspect. What is it going to do to my testimony? How is it going to reflect on my Savior? And then thirdly, how is it going to affect fellowship in the local assembly? What would the consequences of these works of the flesh be in our local assembly? And so it's good to kind of think through these things and, and to meditate on them. And so it's, it's one of the, the, the several lists that Paul gives in Scripture. And sometimes the temptation is just to read over it, not think too much about it. But it's sometimes good just to kind of mull over these things. And so it begins with this, because uh, people have classified them uh, and um, they they put them into different groups, starting with sexual sins. Uh, of course, we said the flesh um, both loves to feed on dirt and it loves to pervert that which is given by God and is a beautiful thing, right? In other words, sex is a beautiful thing in the confines <laughs> of marriage, and, and it's something that, that God has given, and it is a beautiful thing. But Satan and the flesh love to take what God has given that is beautiful and pervert it and twist it and make it into something awful. And so so he begins with this these sexual sins he talks about, um, adultery and, and, and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. So, so, and then he goes on and he talks about religious sins, idolatry and witchcraft, and then what we call social sins, hatred, variance, emulation, so on and so forth. And then excess sins, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And so uh, as we go through them, we'll, we'll try to stick to those categories, although sometimes those categories are a little bit artificial in the sense that adultery, particularly, it is a sexual sin, but it's also a social sin. Because it's a betrayal of family, it's a betrayal of trust, it's a betrayal of vows made before God. It's a very serious thing to commit adultery. And so um, we, we need to think about this. And, and, and of course, it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. Usually, if somebody is involved in an adulterous relationship, the thoughts have been entertained long before the action occurs. And oftentimes, and sadly to say, in our day, I would suggest that adultery is fueled by pornography, uh, fueled uh, by even Christian romance novels, because, of, because sometimes it's women that commit adultery. I, I know of one particular case, a woman was reading all these, uh, these Christian romance novels all the time, and, uh, and her husband you know, came home from work with his oily overalls and all the rest of it, and he just wasn't up to this Prince Charming type characters that she'd been reading about, and the next thing we know is she, she, she meets somebody online, leaves her husband and three children, elder's wife, and goes off and abandons the marriage. Commits adultery with a guy. It's shocking, isn't it? But it didn't just happen. It happened because the flesh was being fed long before the actual event occurred. And so we've got to recognize these things just don't, they just don't happen. There's a, there's a background story. And so um, we, uh, and again, it, one of the things that's contributed to this 
And I recognize how difficult this is. What I'm going to say may not be popular. Uh, I'm not really interested in being popular anyway. I want to be faithful to the Word of God. But I have to say that the woman in the workplace has not been helpful. Right? Because, for one thing, um, she gets dressed up to go to work and looks nice. And I realize there's tremendous financial pressures in our culture. Please don't misunderstand me. But, but, but maybe the, at home, she doesn't get much attention. But at work, across the desk, there's a young fellow that's giving her lots of attention. And it can, it can lead into these kind of things. And so we just have to ask ourselves these questions. Um, you know, kind of, uh, why, why is it such a rampant thing in our culture right now? And there's lots of factors that are involved in that. And, and so adultery, and, and again, it's the flesh. Uh, and and it, again, we, we say this, and I, I just think, what, what, why does God say, by the way, I hate divorce? I think part of the reason is the impact it has on children. I think there's lots more to it than that, but, but I think that really breaks the heart of God. Because children love mom and dad. And so often they're, they're forced to make choices. And oftentimes they're used as a tool <laughs> between them. I mean, they're, 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 uh, they're, it's just a terrible thing. And, and so, again, we, we've, got to, we've got to guard our marriages. And, um, you know, Scripture talks about, um, uh, you know, kind of dwelling with the wife of your youth, always being satisfied with her. We've got to cultivate our own marriages, too. I've just been reading a, a wonderful book. My wife and I are reading it together. It's called Married and How to Stay That Way. And we've been married 41 years. You might say, why do you need to read a book like that? Haven't you got it all down after 41 years of marriage? No, we can improve. We can grow. And so we've been reading this, and it's very challenging uh, and, and, and very helpful. And we want to constantly cultivate our marriage relationships. And, and, you know, kind of, uh, there was a, you know, it's amazing. And communication is so critical. I, I, this is not a marriage seminar or anything like that. But communication is so critical to a relationship, isn't it? Even with our relationship with the Lord, if we, if we don't communicate and allow Him to communicate with us, we grow distant, right? It's, it's all about communications. And, and so uh, communicating with your wife is so critical, uh, talking together, enjoying each other's company. There was a time when when you were first courting, or you know, you you just couldn't bear the thought of being apart. Uh, I remember when my son James was uh, dating his his uh, wife Greta. Uh, uh, of course, they were on two continents, and they would be on. I don't think it was Zoom back then; it was something else. But they were on every single night, and they'd be on for ages. And I'd say to James, like. I thought you talked to her yesterday. Like, you know, what, what else is there to talk about? And I'm just teasing him. But, but it's because that's what it is. When you're, when you're at first in love with somebody, you just love being in that presence. And it's easy after several years of marriage to be like strangers under the same roof. You're both there. You're both together. But you don't, you don't spend that quality time together anymore. You've got to cultivate these things. Because we're setting ourselves up for danger. If we're not communicating with our wives, somebody else comes along and shows an interest and starts talking to them and showing them the kind of affection that we once used to do, and pretty soon before we know where we are, they're gone. Or the other way around with us. So, again, adultery. Fornication. Um, again, there's a lot of discussion on this. I remember talking to David Gooding. I actually went to his home in Ireland. Part of the reason I went is that um, he had a, a, a huge painting of C.H. McIntosh in his hallway that he got uh, from an assembly in Dublin that closed down. And uh, I, I've always been a hero of Mr. McIntosh. So I wanted to go and just pay respects. Uh, it wasn't worship, don't get me wrong, but pay respects just to see this lovely picture. And so we, we got chatting and, and I was asking him about the, the definition of fornication. I've read so many different views and he said this, he said, Fornication is sexual sin in its widest aspect. It covers lots of different things. So I'll give you an example. I, um, I married a couple, and um, uh, 
I remember uh, meeting with him uh, privately one time, and I, I said to him, I said, are there any, you know, kind of hidden sins that your wife needs to know about? Is there anything in your closet that you're hiding? No, 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 no. Yeah. And I asked him directly. I looked him in the eyes. Tell me, is there anything that, you know, we don't want anything coming out afterwards here. So they went ahead, they got married, I performed the wedding, all the rest of it. And I, I, I said to them that, you know, I want to do premarital counseling, but I want to do postmarital counseling as well, right? We've got to meet regularly afterwards. Well, every time I tried to set up an occasion, they wouldn't, it was not convenient. So I couldn't get to meet with them. And next thing I know is they're getting divorced. So I, I got to see her one day. I just happened to run into her in town. I said, what's going on? And she said, when I come home from work, my husband is wearing my underwear, walking around the house. He's a cross-dresser, right? That's, that's fornication, sexual immorality in its widest aspect, right? So, so we got, again, and again, what fuels that? What causes somebody to do that kind of stuff? I want you to notice too, by the way, as we look at these sexual sins, it seems like there's a progression. And what I would suggest to you is this, is that the flesh never is satisfied. It always wants something more filthy and more vile. And so people get involved in pornography and they look at stuff and, and, and maybe it's relatively mild. But the more they do it, that won't satisfy because there's this kind of principle of, of you need, uh, that's why sin is so expensive. You need more of the same to give the same level of satisfaction, you know, or more bizarre. So even in drink, I was a drunkard. And, and, and when I first uh, was a drinker, uh, it didn't take a lot because my body wasn't used to it. So just a small amount of alcohol would give me the buzz that I was looking for. But as I progressed, I had to drink more and more for the same effect. And, and so that's the way sin works. And so people get sucked into pornography and they're just looking at, uh, I suppose, if there is such a thing as mild stuff, but, but they get into more bizarre and wicked stuff as time goes on. And that's just the way sin is, it's progressive. And that's where the flesh is, it's never satisfied. And so fornication, sexual sin of its widest aspect, it is, a work of the flesh. Uncleanness is every, everything is turned into dirt. I remember at work, uh, this is many years ago, but there were people in the office and everything you said, they took it as a sexual innuendo and made it into something dirty. It got to the point where you didn't want to say anything because you knew whatever you said, they were going to twist it and turn it into something. And that's the kind of mind an unclean mind is that everything, everything is turned into dirt. The opposite of, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <laughs> right? Purity. But this is, this is filthiness. This is, this is every conversation, everything. There's always a sexual, and of course, a lot of our uh, entertainment is based on uncleanness. And humor, a lot of it's based on uncleanness. It's, it's sexual innuendo. It's, it's turning things and twisting things. And it's unclean. And it's unacceptable. And it's the flesh. And, and so he, then he goes on and he says lasciviousness. Now this is, we say a lot of this in our day. Lasciviousness is, is no shame. No blushing. Uh, it's, it's this openly wicked with no restraint. It's what you see in the great gay pride parades, you know, where people are, are so in your face and there's, there's not any shame whatsoever. That, that is the idea of lasciviousness. And it's almost like loving to shock, right? Just actually get a thrill out of shocking people. And, and so you can see how this kind of progression and, and so he talks about it. Now, I just wanted to mention this, that as we look at this list, it's not exhaustive, because at the end of it all, it says, and, and such like. And so the, the thing about the flesh is that it's constantly, um, it's constantly progressing. 
And so there's no kind of end limits to it. it, it as, as wicked as the imagination of men's hearts are, that's how far the flesh can go. And I want to remind you that you and I are capable of any of this. If we give in to the dictates of the flesh, any one of these things could be us. Right? And so, again, we've got, to, we've got to recognize this. The capability in my wicked heart is endless if I succumb to that. Right? So we, this is pretty serious, sobering stuff, isn't it? It's serious. And, and so the works of the flesh, this is what it looks like. This is, this is how giving in to the lusts of the flesh looks like. This is the picture. And so then he, he goes on and he talks about the more religious um, manifestations of the flesh. So we, we talked about the rotten flesh and we talked about the religious flesh. So this is religious flesh. And so he talks about idolatry. It's interesting that um, Warren was talking about these four living creatures. And uh, I just go back to Ezekiel chapter 1 just for a second. Keep your finger here. Um, this is, again, one of those hopefully sanctified sidetracks that will be helpful for us. But in terms of idolatry, I think it is a helpful thing to consider. But um, uh, in verse 10 of chapter 1 of Ezekiel, it says, As for the likeness of their faces, therefore had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, therefore had the face of an ox on the left side, therefore also had the face of an eagle. And so, uh, interesting, the rabbis, as they considered these uh, scriptures, uh, one of the comments that they made was this, that man is exalted among the creatures, right? So there's um, versus dominion was given to man, right? Uh, he's, he is exalted amongst the creatures. He's the, he's the pinnacle of divine creation. And then he, the lion is exalted among the wild beasts, right? He's the king of beasts. And then the, the ox was exalted amongst the domestic animals. It was the John Deere tractor of the ancient world, right? If you didn't have an ox, you, you had a clean uh, stall, uh, but you didn't get much work done, right? So, so the ox was cherished amongst the, the, the domesticated animals. Yes, yeah, sorry, it wasn't the pooch. Pooches are useless. They don't do anything unless they're working dogs. But here's the ox. The eagle was exalted among the birds. And you see it, right? I mean, it's used as a symbol of empires, isn't it? The Roman Empire, the Roman eagle, Nazi Germany. They, uh, and what's that other country that does the eagle thing? Yeah, so that, but, and again, it's, it's, it's like, we're, we're the top of the tree, right? We are the exalted nation. That's kind of the picture. <clears throat> <laughs> and, and then he goes on, the, the rabbis went on and said that all of them are stationed below the chariot of the Holy One. Right? So all these exalted creatures are below the one who is the man on the throne in glory on the, on the throne chariot. And so idolatry is when we invert that picture. We turn it upside down. And instead of God being exalted, these creatures, creeping things, are exalted. That's what idolatry is. It's, it's enthroning the creature and dethroning the creator. That's why idolatry is such a serious thing. We're inverting God's order. We're, we're turning the whole thing upside down. And of course, uh, idolatry... Um, is a work of the flesh, religious flesh at its worst. Uh, nothing can be more astonishing than man's determination to worship gods that he has fashioned with his own hands or his own mind. And in our culture, you know, I've, I've been to India, it's kind of interesting that uh, it's kind of almost shocking because we're not used to so blatant idolatry as you would see in India. So there's this big elephant called Ganesh, 
and you'll see these massive statues of Ganesh. There's usually a little mouse at its feet. And, uh, and, and of course, here's a lot of highly intelligent people. I mean, I'm talking about engineers, I'm talking about, you know, kind of doctors, and they go and they feed Ganesh. And here's an amazing thing, an elephant that has no appetite. The bugs love it. I mean, they, they just think this is wonderful because the bugs end up eating all this stuff. But it's just shocking to see it. But what about in Western culture? You see, in Western culture, a more subtle form of idolatry, idolatry is this, substituting men's own thoughts and philosophies for God. And so <laughs> humanism, secular humanism, is a form of idolatry. We have exalted man's cleverness above divine revelation. And it's a religion. Secular humanism is a religion. <laughs> And it's an idolatrous religion. It's glory to man. Humanism, communism, again, we can sort it out. We can solve the world's problems. Rationalism, they're all kinds of authority, works of the flesh that dethrone God and enthrone man. And this is uh, just hateful to God. And so we can see our culture is dominated by the flesh, isn't it? That's the thinking of modern man. This is Canada. This is modern Canada. Right? Exalt man, dethrone God. And not just Canada. It's, it has no borders. It's everywhere. This idolatry. And so, uh, religious flesh. Idolatry. And then he goes on and he talks about witchcraft. Now, it's interesting that the word here is pharmakia. And uh, it, it was... Um, so often, the way to get connected with the demonic spirit world was through the use of drugs. And it is, uh, I remember when we were in New Tribes, of course, we did a lot of uh, study of tribal cultures. And one of the cultures was the Yanomami Indians. And the Yanomami Indians are in Brazil and Venezuela, in the Amazon jungle. They, and they, what they would do is they would, they would t uh, snort up their noses this, this illusionary drug, and it would enable them to get in touch with the spirit world. And, and so, so drugs uh, can indeed cause, and you think of our culture today, they're putting children in school, instead of disciplining them and teaching them how to sit and how to concentrate, we drug them. Mm -hmm. We introduce them to the world of pharmacia. Right? From the very beginning. What are we doing? In the 1960s, everybody would say a turning point in our culture was the 60s. What happened in the 60s? People came back from Vietnam and they got in touch with drugs for the first time. And they brought them back to rural, rural America. And all of a sudden, LSD, all of this stuff. And, and with it came all of the perversion that comes from <coughs> contact with the demonic spirit world. And, and, and even, let's put it down on a practical level. I, I, was, um, I, was, I like to walk, and I was out walking. And one day I got, I got bitten by <clears throat> an oak mite. And um, <clears throat> I couldn't see it. I couldn't see anything, but my whole leg broke out and was just swelled, painful, could hardly walk with it. And so I, the doctor said, oh, you need to, you need to go on uh, a drug. So they put me on some kind of steroid, prednisone, I believe it was. And, um, and I was driving my car. I was listening to, to uh, uh, Vivaldi's trumpet concerto in my car, which is classical music, but it's jolly classical music. Mm -hmm. And all I could hear coming through the, the dashboard was mournful sound. And I wanted to commit suicide. I never had a suicidal thought in my life until that moment. And I wanted to crash the car. Deliberately wanted to crash the car. And I, I, I pulled over because of it. I'm not safe. And what was it? It was a drug. So again, I realized there's, there's a positive side. 
but we have to be very careful of pharmacia because it can introduce us into the spirit world. And you, you hear people on certain drugs, they have all kinds of voices in their heads telling them to do things, all the rest of it. But this is pretty serious. And, and again, I don't think we take this as seriously as we should. We need to be really careful uh, in terms of pharmacia and the use of drugs. And again, it's so much a part of our culture. So we, we just have to be conscious of these things. And, and so again, it's, uh, it's part of um, connected with religious um, uh, flesh. <coughs> and of course, so much of our uh, culture um, is, is giving in um, to, to drugs. And, and, and I know maybe I, I don't know enough about marijuana other than I just read statistics recently that since it's been legalized, that um, the, the occurrences of schizophrenia have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. Elevation of the drag, um, and sometimes even their first drag can be the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so again, we just we have to be careful about this kind of stuff. As a believer, we, we do not need artificial stimulants. We have the spirit of the living God within us. Right, uh, <laughs> and of course we're going to see one of the manifestations of that life dominated by the spirit is a joy that cannot be paid for by artificial stimulants. A joy unspeakable and full of glory. But we've got to just see this is this is uh, religious. And then we go on to the what we call the social sins, um, and of course the world is full of it. But it can happen to us hatred, um, religious, racial. Political strife fostered by this fleshly kind of mindset, hatred and enmity. And of course, don't we see our culture increasingly, hatred is very common, isn't it, in, in our culture? Politically, for instance, more and more polarized, more and more hating the other side. Uh, you see it, you can see it in sport. <laughs> uh, Someone from England can tell you about that, where you hate a certain team and, and even results in physical violence. I mean, that hatred, hatred of other races, right? Like, these, are, these are real things. And, and again, it's not even a color thing, uh, because I, I've been in Africa, and I can tell you that the intertribal hatred comes out at election cycle every time, and they're all the same color skin, but they absolutely hate each other, and, and th there's all kinds of problems. Every election cycle, it's intertribal. And, and so this hatred thing, it's just the flesh. That's what it is. It's the flesh. And um, thank God for the gospel, because it can, it can take away that deep hatred, and we, 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 we kind of fill you with a deep love for people you once hated. But, but again, if you succumb to the flesh, you can get involved in that. And, and again, what feeds the flesh? I've talked to this about this before, but uh, I used to be on the road a lot and I would uh, listen to talk radio and I'd be spitting nails listening to And, and what, what these guys would get me so riled up, you, you begin to look at the other party and you begin to hate them. And it's just the flesh. The flesh is being fueled by this stuff. And I realized I can't handle this. I can't listen to this stuff because it's not helping my sanctification one I alter. So I had to turn it off. It just wasn't healthy. And so hatred, uh, variance, that uh, kind of rivalry uh, that occurs uh, between individuals, uh, hatred, variance, emulations. Uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a, a jealousy. Um, but it's uh, you're so jealous of this person, you want to almost emulate them. You want to be like them, but so you can be better than them. You're kind of competing with them. By the way, let me just say this. It has been a joy to speak here this week with my two brothers because there's no spirit of competition. Amen. I love that, right? And I, and I hate it when that can creep in sometimes, Amen. right? And again, it's, it's, it's this emulation. And, and isn't it interesting, that this idea of jealous of someone, you know, kind of jealous of somebody's gift. And what it is, it's a failure to accept that God uses different personalities and different gifts in whatever way he sees fit. 
And you can't be somebody else. You have to be yourself. I'll never be Warren. Uh, I'm, I'm not committed to writing and, you know, I don't have the mind that he... But, I, but I, I rejoice in Warren being Warren. But I'll never be him. I don't want to be him. God never meant me to be him. You know, and so just recognizing that this, this, there's no room for this amongst the people of God. But, but I'll tell you, even amongst preachers, there is a jealousy and an envy sometimes that manifests itself. None of us are immune from this, though. If we let the flesh dominate. And so, and then after emulations, it talks about wrath. And uh, these outbursts of anger. Bad-tempered people might get over their little outburst, but often they leave scars in other people's memories that are not so quickly eradicated. And um, could that happen amongst God's people? I, I didn't witness it myself, but I... I was told my uh, commanding assembly that in the past there was some kind of business meeting and feelings got so strong that some of the brethren were duking it out in the car park. Can you imagine that? Can't imagine what the Lord's Supper would have been like the next Sunday. I hope there was a lot of brokenness before then. But folks, none of us are immune from this stuff. Outbursts of wrath. Those of us parenting, right? Don't lose it with your kids, right? It's very easy to lose it. And whatever you're trying to teach them, you're unteaching when, when you succumb to outbursts of wrath. These are very challenging things. And so, Lord, help me not to be a bad-tempered person that has outbursts that leave scars in other people's memories. And then strife is party spirit, so often promoted, results in splitting churches, <clears throat> seditions. Um, it's, again, just kind of standing apart. It's kind of, uh, it, it's those who cause divisions uh, are, are, are seditious. They they love to split churches. Uh, again, I've, I, I've seen this. I know one fellow, he, I have no question. You know, we talk about the Lord taking people out in First Corinthians uh, uh, talks in chapter 11. Uh, I, I've seen it. I've actually seen somebody who three times destroyed the testimony, but he never did it the fourth time. And everybody that witnessed that was at that funeral knew it was an act of God. We don't want to be those that divide God's people. It's a very serious thing to divide God's people. And heresies kind of making a choice, a contrary uh, belief often. Envyings, uh, again, just takes uh, jealousy to a next level. Uh, it, 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 Solomon says envy is rottenness to the bones. And, uh, and then uh, we go on to these uh, uh, sins of excess, drunkenness. I just want to say something here as well. I think psychology has had a very negative influence on the church. And, and it, it's affected all of us. So we say to some, oh, he's an alcoholic. The Bible never ever calls somebody an alcoholic. It calls him a drunkard. It, it's not a disease. It's a manifestation of the flesh. Right? So let's be, let's use Scriptural terminology. Now, is, is alcohol addictive? Yes, it is. Of that, there's no doubt. But God would never send anybody to hell for a disease. It's, it's the flesh. It's drunkenness. <clears throat> and, of course, it weakens a person's control over his words, his actions... And um, it, it, it's a very serious thing. And so, again, it shouldn't be seen. Of course, it, was it seen in, in the assembly in Corinth? Yeah, some of them were drunk at the Lord's Supper. Right? So this is... And what amazes me, I have to say, when I first got saved, because England was a 
very much a alcohol dominated culture. Like I remember saying uh, to, to Anne Marie at work, I wasn't saved, she was saved. I said, What the people do who do not go to the pub? I could not imagine life outside of the pub. That was because that was England. That, and it still is England, pretty much. That's the culture. And so um, when, when I got saved, it was interesting that um, I didn't know any Christians anywhere that drunk in the British culture. That it was very antagonistic. In fact, I remember our wedding, uh, one of the elders saying, uh, I hope there's no wine in the sherry. I mean, in, in the trifle, no sherry in the trifle, right? Like even in cooking, they, they, they were just hostile to it. I was shocked that the last time I was back in England, almost every home that I went to, I was offered wine. Isn't that amazing? Like what changed? And, and the, the, the sad thing is that in Christianity um, today, there's this kind of tolerance Right? As long as you don't get drunk. You know, every, every drunkard just began with one glass. Now again, people that are saved out of a lifestyle of drunkenness, and I'm one of them, we tend to be a bit over the top about it. Maybe that's the case. But it scares the daylights out of me. My mother was a drunkard. My grandmother was a drunkard. I'm, I'm, I was third generation. I've seen what it does. It scares the daylights out of me. It really does. And yet it's, it's so acceptable. And, and the, the tragedy is that it does ultimately result in drunkenness. Some of you know the, the, the history of, of exclusivism. And Mr. Taylor, Jim Taylor, used to sit on the platform with a glass of whiskey in his hand. And it was kind of a common thing in the Taylor meeting. Right? This, this is not good because it, what it does is it lowers your inhibitions. So when Mr. Taylor was found in bed with Abishag, how did that happen? Like this is a supposed spiritual leader. This is serious stuff. How does that kind of stuff happen? We can't play with this stuff. We're playing with fire. It's like taking fire in your bosom. You're going to get burned. And then revelings, kind of connected with Bacchus, the god of wine, licentious gatherings uh, with, without restraint, this kind of idea of coming together. And then he goes on and he says such like, in other words, what a terrible poetry it really is. It's just horrendous to, to even think about what the flesh is. And so he says this, he says, uh, having said on such like, Having gone through this horrendous list, he says, of which I tell you there uh, before, as I've told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the, the word do here is the idea of, if this is, if this is a, a settled lifestyle, if this is the practice, is that person even saved? Right? Now, chapter 6, he talks about people being overtaken by a fault. <laughs> but this is way of life. Like for the child of God, these things we're describing ought not to be a way of life. Right? It should be like that. Something happened. Remember we saw the sanctifying effect of, of the gospel? When we got saved, that should have, should have changed all that. But because the flesh is still there, it's, it, we have to be very concerned that we, we don't give in to the lusts of the flesh because the result will be the work of the flesh. And we have, we've got a God against this. And so then he goes on and he says, but, and we've talked about that little word, but. It's a contrast word. And what a beautiful contrast between this polluting factory and this lovely orchard that produces fruit. And you notice the fruit is singular. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace. It's the fruit. It's a singular fruit that has different, uh, as it were, characteristics. And, and I want to just suggest to you that this our time is almost gone, and I was, was thinking, I was hoping to get through this whole thing, this session, but it didn't work, but that's okay. But, but I just want to say this, that it is, I believe that this fruit that the Spirit wants to produce in our lives 
that's described in these terms is actually a composite picture of Christ's likeness. Mm -hmm. What the Holy Spirit wants to do as we yield to Him and His control, rather than giving in to the flesh and its dictates and its lusts, what will be produced will be Christ-likeness in all of our lives. And how beautiful it is in contrast to the works of the flesh. And if everybody in our assemblies were constantly manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, I want to tell you, our assemblies would be the most beautiful place on earth because everybody's acting like the Lord Jesus. And you won't have all the stuff that we know about, sadly, going on amongst us. It'd be a whole different story, wouldn't it? And that's why this topic is so important. I mean, I feel it's important. Obviously, I wouldn't have picked it if I didn't think it was. But I feel it's really important because aren't you getting sick of the flesh and its manifestation amongst the people of God and in your own life. Are you tired of that? Isn't it time for something new? The lovely fruit that reminds people of the Lord Jesus. May God help us with these things. Our time is gone. Let's just pray. Our Father, we, we haven't had a chance to look at this, these, these lovely manifestations that would remind us of thy lovely son but father that's what we would desire for all of our lives that as we go to the meeting that our brothers and sisters as we see them as we observe their lives we would be reminded of your son cause to think about him well father we would hate to think that when people see us they're caused to think about the horrible flesh He's a man of the flesh. Lord, deliver us from these things, we pray. Uh, we, again, will express our dependence because we, we can't, uh, self cannot produce this lovely fruit. It only is as we allow the Spirit of God to manifest Christ's likeness through us that we can ever resemble these things. So we pray for thy help. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And for his glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.